Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Atsuka. Welcome to episode 82 of ADHD for Smartass Women. And in this episode, I am going to introduce you to Natalie Cluck. Natalie graduated last year with a bachelor's degree in computer science from Texas A&M University and was offered a job at NASA's Johnson Space Center. She is now training to become a certified flight controller to fly the International Space Station from Mission Control Houston. So the flight controllers, they're the people on the ground who talk to the astronauts and manage the space station systems. They do the commanding to the space station from the ground that the astronauts don't do in space. What Natalie does specifically is she manages the onboard computing and communication systems. So she sent me a picture of her sitting in front of all these screens and computers, and there is so much going on that I told her that if that was me and I had her job, people would most certainly die. Natalie, did I get all of that right? Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. (laughs) You know, it's just further evidence that each of our ADHD brains is so different, and that includes our strengths. So welcome, and I am so excited to talk to you. And although I want to hear all about your work, but before we go there, I want people to get to know you a little bit first. So in that regard, can we just talk about your ADHD? Can we start with that? Absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it. That's why I'm here. (laughs) Perfect. So tell me when you were diagnosed, like what were the circumstances around your diagnoses? All right. So first of all, my official diagnosis when I actually went to a professional and did the test was earlier this year. So I'm 24 years old, so a little bit late in life to be getting diagnosed. But I first figured out that I might have ADHD a couple of years ago. So I had a friend in college. He introduced me to the How to ADHD YouTube channel, which I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with. And like finding it and discovering Jessica McCabe and her TED Talk that I'm sure a lot of you have already seen before that I still watch on a regular basis just because watching her talk about her experience and also offering her advice on how to deal with basic life skills every day. And her YouTube channel is just finally finding an explanation for why my life has always been so difficult. And I guess finding an instruction manual for how to live my life. So the reason I finally went to get a diagnosis is that um, I just started at Johnson Space Center last year and I've been in flight controller training for about six months now. And in total, it's about a two or three year process. So I'm right in the thick of it. It's a lot like school. So it's a lot of reading, a lot of studying, and the material is a little bit disorganized, but that's so we can get used to being able to search for material when we're on console. So it's me and four neurotypical guys <laughs> on a team. There's a reason I'm saying that. It's because I'm the only one that's a, a little bit different. So that's why I figured out that, that there's probably something special about me. So 
as part of training, we have oral evaluations every few weeks to test over the technical information that we're studying to make sure that we know it. And I was the only one on our team of five that wasn't passing evals on the first time. And it was devastating. And I questioned whether this was the job for me. And I really began to analyze why I was different. And through that process and all the... Can I stop you for a second, Natalie? So um, I am assuming to get a job at NASA, you had to have really good grades in college. Is that true? Yeah. So I came in through something called the Pathways Program. It's NASA's co-op program for college students that if you're accepted, that's pretty much one of the best ways to get in full time at NASA. And you need to maintain a 2.9 GPA to stay in Pathways. And so I struggled in college, actually. I've made straight A's all through my childhood, all through high school. And I could go a little bit about that later if we talk about like childhood and teen years. But it was when I went into college that it really was a challenge. And my grades dropped when I went into college. But I was able to maintain them enough. And I did enough activities. And I did my first internship at NASA when I was a senior in high school, actually. So I had straight A's at the time. And so after that, it was all about who you knew and being able to prove that you can work on a team and be a good leader. And I had that experience. So I managed to maintain above a 3.0 in college. So it worked out in the end. That's for sure. So um, was NASA always a dream of yours from like the time you were a small child or... Well, I wanted to be an astronaut as a kid, like everybody else did pretty much, but it wasn't a lifelong dream. I actually wanted to pursue in my uncle's footsteps because he works at Pixar and he's worked at Pixar for most of my life. So I saw the Pixar movies growing up and I would see like I was really into the arts, but I really love the technical side of it. And I went to A&M originally because he went to A&M and he did the visualization program. And so I went, well, maybe I'll study computer science because I like both the arts and I like technology and I like math and I just like a whole bunch of different things. And so that kind of combined all of my different passions. But that was my original dream job. But of course, I had like 30 dream jobs growing up. <laughs> I'm sure you could understand I wanted to be a, a cancer doctor. I wanted to be the president of the United States. I wanted to be an author, I, <laughs> an astronaut, probably when I was really young. But yeah, flight controller was just never, I didn't really consider that until I actually did one of my internships in this group in flight operations. And there's always something changing. You're on the spot. It's a lot of pressure and you deal with a lot of people. And I think my ADHD brain really, really liked that part and liked the variety and that there's never a dull moment. That's for sure. Yeah, I can totally understand that. Okay. I am so sorry. I caused you to digress. So let's go back to your diagnosis. It's all so interesting, right? I just have to stop and ask because then I, if I don't, I'll forget. I'll totally forget Same. my question. Okay. So let's go back to your diagnosis. So you're in your first year at NASA and you start to realize that your brain maybe works a little different than the neurotypical guys that are working with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, if they find this podcast and they're hearing me talk about this, this is not a complaint at all. This is just, <laughs> this is just a fact <laughs> that, that they have neurotypical brains and I don't. <laughs> so, yeah. so when you're working that close with the same people all the time, you really figure out that, oh, I'm thinking a little bit differently and this method just is not sticking with me. So my brain was just having a hard time with reading and listening to technical material that my brain didn't have an immediate interest in if it didn't have that sudden burst of dopamine, especially during an eight-hour workday when sometimes that's all you have to do is just sit at your desk and study. So I sought out a psychiatrist and took the test because... Natalie, let me stop you for a second. So sure. how did you even know to think, oh, it might be ADHD? Because I had my suspicions for a couple of years, even before I got the test, I mentioned it to my boss, like, hey, like, I'm pretty sure I have ADHD, 
because of all my internet research and comparing all the symptoms like, oh yeah, this is me. This is definitely what I'm dealing with, but also not having a way to adapt to it. And that's what I'm still trying to figure out is just how to adapt to it on a daily basis. But I had a suspicion just from my research the past couple of years before actually getting the test. Did you have any friends that were diagnosed? Yeah, like my friend in college who was the one that introduced me to the How to ADHD podcast. And well, I say, say Natalie, (laughs) sorry, what did you already say that? I think so. My memory, (laughs) my memory is (laughs) terrible. Okay, I'm going to be quiet. Keep talking. (laughs) That's fine. Let's see. Where was I? (laughs) You went to a psychiatrist? Yeah. Yeah, I finally found a psychiatrist, which of course was on my to-do list for a while because I, you know, it's hard for me to actually do things. When I took the test, I forgot what the statistics of the test was, but you need at least a 50 to prove that you had like a high likelihood of ADHD and I scored an 83. (laughs) So uh, I don't know what the highest was, but that seemed pretty high. (laughs) But um. That's pretty much the path that took me to get that diagnosis. And the reason I also fast-tracked the diagnosis was that as a flight controller, we have to do some medical tests and make sure that, oh, we're we're in good health, then nothing's going to happen if we're sitting on console because often you're the only person managing a system on the space station for an eight-hour shift. So they want to make sure you can sit and you know, not die when you're in console for some reason. (laughs) So I mentioned that and they're like, yeah, let's look more into it and make sure that it doesn't impact your work. And, and I can go more into (laughs) why it's not going to impact work and not the, just the training process and sitting on console and how that all compares, but it's definitely a fun ride. Natalie, I am really proud of NASA that they know enough about ADHD that clearly they must know that, wait, there's something about the ADHD brain that would actually be even better for this job. You know, the things that you were saying that you've got to be on all the time and there's so much going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it correctly, but you were saying what you liked about the job was that there was just so much going on. Yeah, absolutely. And even then, because my the biggest symptoms right now are that, oh, I'm not being able to pay attention in class and not passing evals because of it. And of course, it's improved a lot since the beginning. Like I'm still figuring out like just how to take notes and how to study just basic things like that. But it, part of it is also being able to communicate with people like, hey, like it's hard to pay attention in this situation when I'm just learning new technical information that a lot of it is boring sometimes. It's not always talking to astronauts like everybody thinks it is. Sometimes it's just sitting at a desk and reading technical documents all day, but that it wouldn't impact me being able to sit eight hours on console because at that point, I'm not learning new information. I will already be familiar with the system and I will be watching to make sure nothing happens. And that's enough stimulation for me to avoid daydreaming or spacing out, literally. (laughs) Yeah. Just the intensity, right, of the situation that you know how important it is that you are optimally performing. I think that probably puts you into hyperfocus. Absolutely. Yeah. And explaining um, people what hyperfocus is to people who don't experience it is definitely interesting. I always assumed that was normal, <laughs> but working under pressure is a is a good trait to have if you have ADHD, and so it's the perfect job once you get past the school and studying part that I'm currently in. Yeah, and it, I mean, I can see a lot of similarities between this job and, say, an ER doctor or a fireman or an EMT, where you, when you're on, you've got to be on. Oh, yeah. I love Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, trauma surgeon. That's where I would be. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you got the word that, okay, this is ADHD and you had the benefit of hindsight. What are some of the symptoms that you always wondered about, but now you recognize them as, oh my gosh, that was my ADHD. Oh yeah. I think about that all the time. 
like so as a child and as a teenager um, I made straight A's as I said before but I was an avid procrastinator and I'm sure you all can relate I still am I'm just you know finding ways to adapt to that I would write essays the night before I would complete science projects the night before I completed a big major psychology final project the night before and I ended up winning some kind of award and ended up going to Arkansas for a big conference to present it. But I, nobody could tell I did it the night before. Um, I'm proud of that. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I wrote speeches for speech class in the car on the way to class <laughs> and managed to pull it off. <laughs> and nobody suspected they had any issues because I made the grades and nobody noticed how hard I was working to get those grades. And I didn't even realize that I was working harder than most people were. I was always late. I was messy. My mom was always on me about it. (laughs) And I was just trying. I felt like I was trying so hard on the inside and on the outside. It doesn't look like I'm doing anything. Right. So I'm curious, what does your mom think now? So I'm I'm definitely a lot more open about it. I've told her, hey, I've had a medical professional tell me that I have a problem. (laughs) (laughs) So it's not just me being a troublesome kid. (laughs) Yeah, it's not a character flaw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she also recognizes a lot of those symptoms in her, I think. So I think maybe she's considering, hmm, maybe I also have it because it is genetic. I can recognize it in a lot of my family members. So it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So since you've been diagnosed, what has changed? I should ask you, are you one of the lucky ones that medication actually works for you? Yes. So on top of ADHD, initially, my big issue, especially in college, was depression, just depression and anxiety, especially like test anxiety, social anxiety. And when I started looking into the ADHD thing, I didn't realize, oh, I guess depression and anxiety just from being overwhelmed and challenged all the time is a result of ADHD. But that same psychiatrist, I started meds for ADHD. I also started on some meds for the depression and the anxiety. And I'm like, man, like I have so many pill bottles now. Like what's wrong with me? Like, I don't want to be on this forever. But at the same time, it's like, I actually feel like a normal person. It's like, I'm not just trying to get through the day because I'm not going to show that to everybody and how much I'm struggling throughout the day. But up until It just happened to be around when COVID started that I started taking the medication. Thank you. Thank God. Yeah. So I've been kind of, it's been nice because I have a remote environment. I've just, I'm just in my apartment all the time and it's quiet and it gives me a chance to adjust to the medication and also figure out my study methods since I'm working from home without having to also deal with the having to get to the office on time and get back from the office on time and work those eight straight hours in the, in the cubicle. But yeah. So Natalie, um, (laughs) is your anxiety and depression comorbid or are you noticing that by treating the ADHD, the anxiety and depression is getting a lot better and maybe even resolving itself? Or do you know yet? I'm still figuring it out, but I just know that like everything has gotten better at the same time. A big, a big part of it is that with ADHD, specifically the symptoms that I wasn't aware was part of ADHD that I just thought were so-called personality flaws. I think just knowing that I have that diagnosis and I have that label and I can attribute it to something other than me and myself and my personality is enough to lift off some of that shame that I've been carrying my whole life without realizing it and just avoiding people because of it and being afraid of judgment, especially in social situations and never asking for help because I'm afraid of being judged for feeling like I should have known something already that everybody else heard at some point that I didn't hear and things like that. But I think that the biggest change is the diagnosis is recognizing that it's a difference in my brain and that these odd habits or struggles with simple task is not a personality flaw. And it's that itself has been a life changer. 
Absolutely. And, you know, you said something at the beginning that I thought I'd love to hear that too, that, you know, our brains, they just come with a different operating manual. And when we figure out, and, and what's even worse about it is it's not like every ADHD brain comes with the same operating manual, right? So just because it works for me doesn't mean it works for you. And so it does take a lot of just practicing different things and trying different things to see what combination works for your brain. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I'm just figuring out those little tips and tricks that maybe I could have figured out if I was a kid with ADHD, well, diagnosed with ADHD <laughs> and learned how to just live every day, like make sure how I know to brush my teeth and keep my room clean and just get tasks done, basic stuff. But yeah. So Natalie, are you primarily in attentive or are you combined type or do you know? I would say I'm, um, let's see, they didn't say whether I was the combined type. I'm definitely not the hyperactive type by itself. I would lean more towards inattentive since I've definitely been defined as a space cadet my entire life, <laughs> even before I was. Perfect. Yeah. You're an NASA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't even realize that. I'm like, oh yeah, like now I'm an actual professional space cadet <laughs> before I even was interested in space. So. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay. So let's talk about space now. So what are the ADHD traits that you feel make you an even better flight controller than those neurotypicals sitting next to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I touched a little bit about like, well, I forgot what I already said, so I might just repeat it. I think that <laughs> My ADHD traits, they make me very well-rounded. I'm good at many different things, so I'm never bored. I love tech. I love math, computers, anything creative, arts. Um, I enjoy working with people despite my social anxiety, which is just a huge contradiction. And all of these things contribute to me being able to contribute something unique in every situation. And I'm also a good teacher because I'm aware of other people's learning styles and how to adapt to them and make sure everybody is on board. And as far as NASA goes, with systems, since my brain likes to learn things by putting together a big picture in my head and piecing together lots of moving parts rather than a step-by-step -step process that I guess a lot of neurotypical people seem to follow, I have an advantage when it comes to systems engineering. I'm able to see all the bits and pieces and easily see how they coordinate and work together. So if there's a problem that arises in our space station system, my brain works really fast under pressure, is able to see how everything coordinates together faster than maybe, a, I don't want to say normal person, someone who doesn't have that special brain might not be able to do. Yeah. So you see those connections. You can put it all together. Yeah. Once I get past the learning everything for the first time phase, that's always slower. That's a really interesting observation, actually, Natalie, that it's the learning that may take a little bit longer. But once we learn it, we connect things that your neurotypical brain person wouldn't even think to include. Mm -hmm. And so we come up with many different things. We come up with ideas that maybe your neurotypical brain person would not come up with, you know, because we can make all those connections. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anything else? Let's see. Other ADHD traits responsible for my success. Yeah, those are some of the big ones. I talk a lot, so part of ADHD, <laughs> I either never talk. It's it's funny because I grew up being the quiet one, probably because I was just daydreaming all the time and just not in reality whatsoever. But in my job, we have to talk a lot, as in communicate. So no, we don't only, only have to know the systems, but we have to, we call it packaging our words. So we have like a failure impact workaround. So if something happens in our system, we have to say, okay, this is the failure. This is what it could possibly impact. Like things like, okay, the impact is we might lose calm with the crew, or this might impact Spartan systems. Like they're another console position that deals with the electrical systems. And then a workaround, which is, okay, this is what it could impact. We need to see 
if this is time critical and see what our plan forward is and how much time we have to do it. So it's definitely an art because you're speaking all of these things over the flight loops that everybody can hear. And you want to say it clearly and concise in a way that everybody can understand, especially the flight director who makes the final decision on everything. So when you are speaking, are you speaking to the astronauts or you're speaking to all the other pods that are supporting the astronauts? I'm using all the wrong words. I'm certain. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can say, well, pods, we, they're consoles. We can say consoles, but I like pods. That's a cool nickname for them. So I personally don't talk to the astronauts. There's only one person who is talking to the astronauts and that's the Capcom. <laughs> I can imagine if they're all, oh my God, that would be a mess. <laughs> oh, yeah. But also, we have several different flight loops that we're all talking to. So for my console, we have what we call front room and back room. So the person that you would see in mission control, that's our front room operator. We also have a back room operator that you can't see that's off in another room. And they're doing a lot of the technical stuff. And then the front room person is checking and verifying all the technical stuff that the backroom operator is doing, such as checking commands before you send them to the space station and so forth. And our front room operator is the one who talks to the flight director or talks to the team. And there's two different loops to do that. There's a loop for everything. And sometimes you're just listening to 10 different loops at once, which I guess ADHD helps with that, with paying attention to lots of different conversations going on. Absolutely. And then being able to connect them all, right, into something that is important. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so yeah. I'm wondering, when you say that, I think you said this, you have to package your words. Is that hard for you? Because it would be really hard for me. It definitely takes practice. But I think because we've done enough practice to where we're in a pretend scenario where we're on console and something happens. But it was definitely a challenge in the beginning. But I think after a while, you kind of notice patterns and you get more familiar with the, sim the symptoms, systems. <laughs> and after a while, it's just automatic. So you don't have to think about it too much. So that's what I'm hoping because I'm definitely still in the beginning. So it'll improve over time. But I get a lot of feedback from instructors on how I can improve. But I try and remember and take notes and improve each of those little pieces of feedback each time. So by the time I get on console, it'll be A-OK. -okay. <laughs> I can't imagine better training for the ADHD brain that has a problem with, I mean, someone will ask me a question and I will, I, I'm a verbal processor. So I'm literally like vomiting all over, right? Yes. Trying to figure out how do I really <laughs> feel versus this really trains you to pause, to think about what you're going to say and then to say it, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. We have a acronym called STAR. Okay, well, NASA loves acronyms. <laughs> but um, we have something called STAR. It's stop, think, act, and oh no, I forgot what R is. I hope they're not React. listening to this. React. That is it. That is it. React. I think. <laughs> well, act doesn't make sense. Anyway, I will look that up later. That's a lookup. Yeah, you need to look that up. Let me know what it is because I can already tell that's a great acronym for our brains. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. The stop part is definitely the troubled part for me. But with practice, I've gotten better about it. Okay. So I have a question for you. So when you look back on your life and, you know, your childhood and your high school years, college, and you know, even where you are right now, although I think you've answered it for where you are right now. Have you always felt different than others? Absolutely. I always knew there was something different about me. I even got tested when I was, when I was like two years old. I don't know if I was tested for ADHD. I think I was tested for autism because I never talked. <laughs> but it's a running joke that like, yeah, we got you tested when we, you were young. And, but apparently you just, you just didn't have anything to say. But you say now you talk a lot, right? Yeah, I think it's definitely a mix. I either never talk because I'm in my head and I'm I'm talking a lot in my head. Or if I'm talking out loud, I can't stop. 
and I just ramble and go off on side tangents or side quests. So do you think what could account for that is interest when you're really interested in something, then, you know, you want to talk about it. You want to learn more versus when you're not, it's like, you know what? It's more interesting in my head. (laughs) Yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think my mind's just always looking for something new and interesting. And then it, you know, it loses that interest a day or two later, if not five minutes later. And if somebody else is talking about something interesting, like, oh, I'm all in this and it's easy to listen to what they're talking about. But if like my boyfriend starts talking about a movie I've never seen or that I don't care about, like, oh, okay, yeah, I can nod along and pretend that I'm listening because I've improved (laughs) that skill a lot over my life, pretending I'm listening. Absolutely. And then in your mind, you're like, would you just shut up? Because I am thinking about something that's so fascinating and I can't do both at the same time. (laughs) Yep. Oh my gosh. And I think my boyfriend also has ADHD because I joke around that, well, he knows that he will think of something or we talking about something and then we'll jump to a couple of different topics after that. And I can tell that he's still focused on that last thing that we were talking about (laughs) because 10 minutes later, he'll continue on from the conversation we were having 10 minutes ago. And I'm like, you weren't listening to me this whole time, (laughs) were you? You were thinking about something else. Well, you know, I make a joke with a lot of my friends and I tell them that, look, if you like me and you're hanging around me, there's a good chance you're like me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) attract each other, right? Either absolute opposites or we're very alike. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) And one theory I had, because in high school, I was homeschooled. So everybody I knew, you know, they had different reasons for not going to a public or private school. But I kind of understood ADHD as like a normal thing. Like everybody seemed to have it. And so I didn't think of it as a big deal. Like, oh, okay, like maybe I have ADHD too. Like everyone seems to have it because we're all homeschooled. <laughs> I don't know why. No, but that's interesting. So my question for you is, when did you start being homeschooled and why did your parents decide to do that? So I was in the eighth grade when we started. Before that, I went to a very small private school all the way from pre-K to seventh grade. and there was like 80 people in the entire school. So I had like eight people in my class. So then the school closed down that year. And that was terrible because it was like family at that point. So it was kind of a running joke. (laughs) My grandpa likes to make jokes and he would always joke, oh, I'm going to homeschool you guys at some point as like a threat. And then it turned out that we actually ended up doing that. (laughs) So and it worked out. Although, so the first year in eighth grade, we tried to do everything at home, like with just me, my brother, and my mom at the kitchen table. My brother was the teacher's pet, and I was the class clown, I think. (laughs) And my mom tried to get me to read Pride and Prejudice. And uh, first of all, it was having to do something my mom told me to do, which was never a good thing. And just reading a book that I just was not interested in and couldn't follow along. And so she was always on me. Did you read Pride and Prejudice? Like, no. And so she would try reading it out loud. Like, oh, this is even worse. I'm just going to (laughs) stay off and think about something else. She would ask me questions about it. I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't listening. So at one point, we got into a little fight about it. And she threw it out the front door. She just threw the book into the front yard. (laughs) So that we stopped doing homeschooling at home. After that year, I ended up taking my classes at this homeschool support center that was close by all through high school. And so that's where I had met friends. That's where we had honor society. We had a prom. We had all the general school stuff. But instead of being there eight hours a day, it was more like one, two or three hour class a week. And that part prepped me for college a little bit, just getting used to the sporadic classes versus having to sit all day. But now I'm facing that at work. So I haven't had to sit in one place for eight hours except for my internships at NASA and then being a full-time professional. So, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So why did your mom decide though? I mean, I understand initially your school closed down. 
but Mm -hmm. did she know something about you and your brother that you just weren't going to do well in a big old public school environment or even a big old private school environment? That is interesting. I think it wasn't specifically because of us. I think she was the type like, oh, I want the best for my kids. I want to put them in private school. Originally, it was just going to be like for pre-K and kindergarten. I think she was still looking for options. And then we just ended up falling in love with the teachers and the people at the school. And it was really like a family, which is a very unique experience. Not a lot of people get to experience that. So I can understand then why college was an especial struggle for you. Mm-hmm. And I went to a big school. A&M is a lot of people. It's what, at least 60,000 students. And I think I got a little bit overwhelmed, I think. And my mom was right. I hate to admit it, but she knew it was coming. She's like, yeah, it's a big school. I feel like you should go to a smaller school or go to community college first. I'm like, I'm not going to community college. I want to move away from home. I'm going to move two hours away, (laughs) even though I wanted to go to another state or another country. They're like, nope, it's a Texas school or bust. Like, okay, fine. I'll settle for A&M. But yeah, you don't have to put that in here. A lot of Aggies would be like, what? (laughs) <laughs> Two percenter. <laughs> I noticed that lanyard in the photo that you sent me, the lanyard, it says Aggies on it, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, I'm in California and we have the UC system here. And one of our schools is UC Davis, which is where I did my undergrad. And, you know, we were called the Aggies, which is so Oh, really? Cool. And so you guys are called the Aggies too? Yeah. Oh, I didn't oh, yeah. know that. I didn't know UC Davis had Aggies too. <laughs> Yeah, they used to cow tip for, you know, fun on the weekends. Oh, nice. (laughs) Yeah, our mascot is a border collie. Oh. (laughs) I don't know if that really has anything to do with the Aggie part. I think Aggie is supposed to come from agricultural. So, Mm -hmm. but the border collie is adorable and her name is Reveille and she's the best mascot of all time. Well, it's kind of Aggie-like because, you know, you need border collies to herd, right? I guess so. It makes sense. Okay. So what do you think to living successfully with ADHD is? And I know you're kind of new to the game, but what are you kind of thinking? I think a big thing, the first thing I thought of when I was thinking of how to live successfully with ADHD is just to forgive yourself. I was way too hard on myself, you know, my entire life because of the nature of just having to deal with my symptoms and not really having an explanation for them. Now I feel like I'm able to forgive myself a little bit and let go of that shame that I carried around with me and that my ADHD is not who I am as a person, that I can separate the two and be like, you know what, who I am is how I'm adapting to this. And the fact that I have good intentions, that I am trying, like that's who I am. It's not the executive dysfunction part that's me. That's the ADHD and kind of carrying it around as a, a little, I guess, friend in my brain that I just have to deal with sometimes. And something else I would recommend is just surround yourself with people, especially your close friends and your partner that you can trust with your feelings that you can talk about this stuff with, without judgment. And even if you have people who don't necessarily believe that ADHD is a real thing, just be open about it and have like a 30 second elevator pitch to summarize like whatever your strongest symptoms are that affect you. Even if it feels like you're a broken record and it's hard to explain to every person you meet or work with in your life, it's still important to increase that awareness that there are adults with ADHD who face these experiences on a daily basis. And it's especially hard when it's a disability that you can't see. Absolutely. And I think so much of the shame comes from this idea that you're hiding. You know, I hear women saying they haven't told their kid that they've been diagnosed with ADHD. And I'm like, well, how do you think the kid's going to feel 10 years from now when he figures out or she figures out I have ADHD and my parents never told me, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I completely agree. You know, get around people where you can feel comfortable talking about it. If you don't feel comfortable talking about it, if you're in all this shame about it, you're in the wrong environment, bottom line. Mm -hmm. So that and that we have so many strengths, as Natalie pointed out. Yeah, 
there's weaknesses, absolutely. I mean, I don't subscribe to this idea that ADHD is a superpower, but the reality of it is we do have little superpowers in our strengths, you know, and they're usually the flip side of our weaknesses. So I couldn't agree with you more. So Natalie, what is your number one, then I'm going to let you go. What is your number one ADHD workaround? My number one ADHD workaround is to eliminate the decisions that you have to make throughout the day to avoid getting overwhelmed. If you need an outside helper to make decisions or set reminders for you, whether it's a person or an app or setting a bunch of alarms to go off, by all means, just do it. And something I would recommend in particular for morning and evening routines, I found an app called Brilli that was recommended on the How to ADHD YouTube channel where you can input your routine tasks and assign a timer to each one. You can put in like what time you absolutely have to be done with the routine and it'll adjust the time for each task based on that. And it's been an absolute life changer. Of all the apps I've impulsively installed on my phone, that's the only one that's really stuck (laughs) that I actually use. So what is it? It's really, how do you spell it? B-R-I-L-I. Okay. I have not heard of that one, but I am definitely going to download it and try it. Yeah. I think it's meant for kids, but I'm just adjusting to make it work for me (laughs) as an adult. No, I mean, absolutely. I think the simplest things are what work best for us. If we get something that's all complicated, we just won't do it versus I actually look for the apps. When I see that, oh, this is for a kid, I think, okay, maybe I can actually use this successfully. Absolutely. Natalie, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. I just love everything that you shared. And I am especially thrilled that even at NASA, there are smart ass ADHD women. So if people want to find you, if they want to know more about you and what you do, if they want to ask you a question, can they do that? Absolutely. What would be the best way for them to do that? Um, You can contact me on Instagram. My handle is astronat, A-S-T-R-O-N-A-A-T-T, because apparently with one A and two T's, that name was already taken. Perfect. Okay. So I will have all of that in the show notes, as well as the how-to YouTube show, Jessica McCabe's TED Talk. You talked about the app, really. I'll put all of that in show notes with your Instagram handle. Natalie, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Absolutely. So that is what I have for you for this week. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Natalie, please let us know by leaving us a review. Our goal is to change that conversation around ADHD so that we can help as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too can discover their amazing strengths. And you know what? Your reviews, they really help in that regard. They're like those little gold stars we used to get on our work when we were kids in school. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Of course, that's my email. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.